So please welcome Don. Thank you, Dave. Yes, it's me again, gang. Um, you'll get Barry back hopefully on, uh, on Sunday. Um, it's tough that bronchitis, I had it a couple years back. They, actually, the medicine they gave me was worse than the, the disease, but that's a whole other story. You, you ever get a, a, some type of medicine that doesn't feel, fit well with you and you kind of, kind of, yeah, anyway, that's fate on it. But anyway, uh, it's nice to be here. A um, couple things. Number one, uh, I don't know if any of you saw it, we had our first program on his channel, um, Breaking News, 10, 10 a.m. on Monday. And I guess it went well enough. They're going to let me do next week again, too. So that went well. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a blessing getting back, doing that again, and uh, watching the Lord work. Uh, plus, um, we're going to, I'm not announcing it yet. We're going to wait till the end of the month. But we're, we're doing my book, the, it'll be the audio of, the, of my next book, 25 Signs, we're near the end. I am started to record it. I did, uh, did it today. It's going to be about probably 10 hours worth of recording. So there would be an audio giveaway besides not, uh, for his channel for June. And then eventually the book should be out like in July or August. I'm very, very, very excited about that. So a lot of good things happening. And... Um, you know, I'm sorry, Barry isn't here, but I'm always glad to see you. I've got a message tonight I think is going to be a blessing. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14, and I'm going to share a message with you that has really been life-changing for me, and hopefully it will be for you too. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, we're going to read there through verse uh, 22. By the way, all the tea books are together. If everyone wants to know what's what, Timothy, Titus, Thessalonians, if you find one, the other can't be far from it. All right? 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says this, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the undisciplined, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient towards all. See that no one renders or pays back for anyone evil, evil for anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Always rejoice, constantly pray, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not extinguish the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but examine all things. Hold fast to what is good. Stay away from every form of evil. All right. It was many years ago. In fact, I was trying to calculate that, and I, I mentioned... Um, what was it, uh, sun yeah, Sunday, it was a few days ago, about had an episode that happened in 1977. Well, this happened the same year, uh, 1977, it was summertime. And I'm, I'm just starting out as a public speaker, starting to travel and uh, uh, people starting to, you know, know what I can do and this sort of stuff. And um, I got asked to do a, um, a high school retreat and the retreat was in uh, Wisconsin. There's a, uh, there was, I don't know if they still got the conference center there. It, it was between Chicago and Milwaukee. And it was a you know, pretty well-known Lake Geneva, if you've ever been there, that area. Beautiful, beautiful area. So anyway, uh, I was asked to do this retreat. They had about four or 500 high school kids. And it re went really well. And I'd finished my next to the last talk. And I'm ready for one final one. And, and the camp director comes up to me and says, you know, it's been really good what you've done so far but this is your last talk, okay? Make it a home run, make it really, really, really great, okay? I said, sure. Well, the trouble was in those days, I hadn't talked that much to groups, and I gave every talk I knew already. I didn't have a talk. In other words, oh, I gotta be good, I don't even know what in the world I'm gonna say. I had no idea whatsoever what to do, so what do you do in that case? You pray, and you ask the Lord, uh, you know, God, give me something to say, give me something that can minister to these kids. And so I was reading this portion here of 1 Thessalonians, and a, a, a thought struck me. I said, you know, this is Paul's first letter to a church, first one as far as we can tell uh, chronologically, all right? And he ends this letter by giving these people these encouraging words. He sends them off as they read the letter with these encouraging words. I thought, you know, 
what if I do something like that? Because I'd been traveling around for a while, around the U.S., and I thought, what if I do something like what Paul did, writing some letter to these kids with encouraging words, things that I've seen just in the year, year and a half I'd traveled around the U.S. and abroad, that would help them uh, in their Christian walk. So I put together a talk, I called it uh, 10 Principles for Successful Christian Living, and I gave it, and uh, basically the idea was this. I told them, look, you know, I've traveled a bit, I've talked to people, wherever I go, people got the same problems, whether they're in, uh, in Europe, whether they're in one part of the country or the next. Everybody as human beings got the same issues. Even you, you know, high schoolers got the same things. I've talked to high schoolers, junior high, college, graduate students. They all got the same issues. So hopefully we can give you some principles to help you get through the, the struggle of the Christian life uh, using these, these principles. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul, though I'm not an apostle. I'm going to write you my own letter, and I'm going to share things that have helped me out uh, to get through, you know, my Christian life. I've been a Christian about uh, eight or nine years. Actually, it was later, late 70s, probably, uh, well, 78, 79, whatever it was. But anyway, and so I gave the talk, and the Lord blessed it. And literally, I've probably, in the last almost 40 years, giving it uh, I've probably given it 500 to 1,000 times in various forms to various groups, and you know, tailored to the each group, obviously, because these things continue to help me, what I'm going to share with you tonight, and hopefully they will help you too. And it's basically principles for successful living God's way. In other words, if I were writing a letter now to Calvary Chapel of um, Tustin, and I was going to say, here's, here's what's helped me as a Christian live my life, these are things that hopefully can help you. I would give you these things. So whatever it's worth, we're going to get through a few of them tonight, and hopefully they'll be as big a blessing as they are to you as they are to me. And by the way, I still think of them. I still try and put them into play here some 40-odd years later. Okay, the first one is the most important one. And if I was going to tell you one thing, if I was going to write a letter to you and give you an exhortation, the first thing I would tell you is to get a biblical view of God. First and foremost, to get a biblical view of God. Because I believe 80 to 90% of our problems would go away if we really understood who the God of the Bible is. In other words, if we had a proper biblical view of God, the issues that we faced would not seem so horrific or so terrible. Now, the problem is, if we took a poll intellectually, all of us would say, oh, of course, I believe in God. I believe he's a big God. He can do anything. And yet, practically speaking, uh, we don't live that way often, do we? A number of years ago, a couple... Uh, actually a generation or two ago, a British uh, Bible translator named J.B. Phillips wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. And basically he said this, you know, same thing. Yeah, you believe in a big God, but when it comes down to it, do you really? Do you really believe in your, your God can do anything? Now the verse here would be Jeremiah 32, 27, which we mentioned to you Sunday morning. Behold, I am the God of all humankind. Is anything too difficult for me? And the answer is no, nothing whatsoever. Intellectually, we may believe it, but what happens is, uh, practically speaking, uh, God ends up, you know, not the big God of the universe. He ends up this little tiny peewee God, and our troubles, our trials, and our problems are seemingly dwarf him because when we have issues, we don't see the greatness of God. We just see our problems, how difficult they are. And so one of the things that have helped me is to understand who God is, to know, and this is why it's so important to study the Bible, so important to know the whole biblical story, how God intervenes for his people, and then just get this proper view of who he is. One of the things we learn is that God is actually pulling for us. He wants us to succeed. He wants us to walk the straight and narrow. He really does. I don't know about you, but I grew up with an idea of God, and the few times I did go to church, of a God who couldn't wait for me to do something wrong so he could stomp on me, right, and judge me and, and punish me. And then you go into church, and what they would tell you what Christianity is all about is kind of like the dirty dozen. If you're a Christian, here's the things you don't do. And that's what my thought of a Christian was. You don't do this, don't do that. That, by default, makes you a Christian, okay? And so my view of God was one who was not a God who was approachable, but a God who was kind of scary, right? A God who was wanting to crush me, a God who really wasn't on my side. And so that's why I didn't darken the door of a church till, you know, much later in life when just by a, a series of circumstances, I ended up at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa in, in um, March of 1970. And as the rest, as they say, is, is history where God, you know, saved me. I didn't find God. He wasn't lost. I was lost. He found me at that particular time. But anyway, so I started to learn who, who God is. And I started to learn that, look, 
he all, you know, Romans 8.28 is still in the Bible. God calls us all things to work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. And he's really on our side. But if we understand it, if we understand what he's trying to do in our life, it won't be as difficult as we think. Now, we're going to have trials, we're going to have difficulties, but if we see the greatness of God, you know, our trials aren't going to look that huge, they're not going to look that big, because he can do it. He can do anything according to his will. So, again, Jeremiah 32, 27, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? It was interesting. One of the, the um, verses I would quote in this would be was Psalm 50, 15. The Lord says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will answer you and you will glorify me. In other words, because we know who God is, we call on him in the day of trouble. I remember it was like oh, a couple years after I'd, I'd started doing this talk, I I think it was first or second time I went up to Northern California to the city of Paradise, which is above Chico. Some of you may know the area there uh, in Northern Cal. And I've, I've been going back there for some like 30 odd, odd years. But it's like the first or second time there, I was going to give this talk. And all of a sudden there's this huge billboard on the side of the road and it has Psalm 5015, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will answer you, you'll glorify me. I thought, yeah, that's what I want to talk about, Lord, thank you. And so again, when God is called upon in the day of trials, when you and I experience them, he will answer and he will glorify himself if we just open ourselves up to him. I had a Bible professor once that gave this illustration. He said, when you have a, have a, a problem that you really can't deal with, in other words, a problem that's really difficult to handle and you've done everything you can to do with it, what you do is first of all, you ask yourself, have I done everything I'm supposed to do? And then you ask yourself, okay, if you have and the issue is still there, can God do anything about it? Is God able to do anything about it? And he said, that's why we go to the Bible. We start reading the Bible. We find out God is, uh, you know, all powerful. Jeremiah 32, 27, the creator of the universe. We can read the miracles of Jesus. We can read the great things he's done. So we get it in our nugget that, yeah, God is able to do something about my problem. But then we ask another question, the last one. Is God willing to do something about my problem? And you know what we find? We find God is not only willing to do something about the issues we go through, he's practically begging us to give it to him so he can show his majesty in our lives. In other words, when we come to the end of our rope, he turns it around and honors um, himself through honoring us. I had a, a, a real, real difficult trial went through and by the grace of God, it, you know, it's finally, finally over. It was a, an awful long one, six years, seven months, but who's counting, right? It's very difficult. And when the Lord finally turned it all around, I looked back and I watched how God had connected the dots and all of this, but also too, what, at the very beginning of it, because I knew it was gonna be, was, you know, one of these things gonna be a long haul. You say, okay, I know at the end, intellectually, that it's going to be okay because, you know, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I knew that it's going to be okay. I didn't know when or how. And so what I wanted to do, instead of mope around and complain and that, now it was hurtful, but instead of doing all that, thank God ahead of time how he's going to deliver. And he did. He really did. And in fact, looking back now, I could really see the wisdom of, of all that went on. But the point is this. You know what got me through it? Having a biblical view of God. Understanding who God is is the only thing that got me through it. I would go on these walks and I say, God, I need you. Be God in my life. You be God. I don't want to take your, your role. You know, I've tried that. It doesn't work. You know, I've, I don't do real well at being God. You do great at it. Let's do the right roles here. And what I found is when you allow God to be God, it's amazing how life is not as difficult as it may seem. It's problems and difficulties, yeah. But uh, you watch his majesty. You watch his supernatural works. And, you know, all I can say is I've seen so many miraculous things happen just because I allowed God to be God. And the thing I'm still learning to do is get out of the way and let him run things and watch him work. Remember Moses there at the uh, Red Sea? Uh, I, I always think of Charlton Heston, the movie, The Ten Commandments, you know, and he's there and you know, there's the, the Red Sea there and there's the Egyptians coming, you know, ready to attack him. And he puts, you know, he says, 10 times God has delivered you. Talk about the plagues. Then he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And of course, the sea parts and they go across. So well, that's what the Lord wants us to do many times, to watch his majesty, to watch the supernatural, to watch him really, really work. See, one of the problems that I found, you know, that we all get in this routine, that the more I become a Christian, 
the less I forget how wonderful it was, you know, how new it was when I first became a believer, but sometimes I think I miss the supernatural too because God wants to work supernaturally in our lives. We don't give him enough credit to do that. We think we have to do everything. I know I thought I had to do everything, but once we have that proper view of God and God is saying, you know, how many times we read in both the Old Testament, the New Testament, basically saying, let me work, trust me, follow me, honor me, and I'll honor you. For Samuel 2.30, he says, I'll honor those that honor me. And so we honor him, he will honor us. But first and foremost, you got to know who your God is. You have to have that proper view of God. So once you have that, once you have that, like I said, I believe a lot of your issues, a lot of the problems will be solved in life. All right, after we get that biblical view of God and do that, there's a second thing that we have to have, and that is to have a proper view of ourselves, a biblical view, a proper view of who we are. The first is to know who God is, but then we need to know who we are as Christians, our strengths and our weaknesses. We're not, we shouldn't try and be someone we are not. But many times we attempt to do that. Uh, my testimony and story was, uh, I think I've told you this before, when I was a new Christian, I was at the beginning of the uh, Jesus movement and it was so exciting. We would actually, you know, wait outside the church for them to open the doors, rush in, try and get a seat. And I would sit, uh, you know, the, the, the church was full. I would actually sit on the stage, you know, on the floor on the stage watching the musicians at that time and watching the gospel be preached and people come to Christ literally about every night. And I want to be like these musicians, okay, because I saw them bringing people to Jesus. I had a heart to bring people to Jesus. And so what I was going to do, I was going to be a Christian musician and lead many, many people to Christ through my music ability. I had one small problem. I didn't have any talent. Okay, no ability, but that didn't stop me. So what I did, got a guitar, got together with some guys. We're going to form a group, wrote a couple of songs. I'm going to be that great Christian musician. Well, we started practicing, and all of a sudden we're playing the guitar. Everybody stops and looks at me. I said, what? I said, well, no, you're, you're, not, you're not on. You're not on. Oh, yeah, I am. Okay, let's do it again. Boom, boom, boom. And they stop again, put their guitars down, and look at me. I go, what? No, you're off. You're off, you know. And finally I realized... I was off. I didn't have that gift. So I, you know, kind of walked out sheepishly thinking, there goes my career as a Christian musician. You know, I'm, I'm done. What can I do with my life? Well, God had some other ideas, but I, if it were up to me, I wanted to do this. But I didn't learn to accept, I, the hard way I did, the gifts that God has given me. Um, we've, some of us got gifts and some of us fortunately have spouses that make up for it. I'm, I'm fortunate in that area, I tell you. I, um, a number of years ago, I was speaking to this, this uh, college group, and uh, well, actually college teachers, Christian college teachers, and here is the way I was introduced by the person. I had this uh, CD at the time that put together like uh, these different courses, which eventually became my books and that, and the, the, the person introduced me this way. He says, I have a hard time explaining the breadth and the, you know, what is in here, it's almost incomprehensible, all this, because I did a lot of all the work that's done. But I got to tell you, Don is the world's worst businessman. And I agree, I admit it, I just don't have the gift, because I give everything away, you know, I, I don't need business gifts at all. Fortunately, I got a very good wife that knows how to, you know, keep me on the straight and narrow that way. But I realized, I don't, that's not what I do. I do other things. I know what I'm good at, I know what I'm not good at, and I want to stick in the area of the gifts that God has given me. What I've seen are people that, no matter what, they're going to do this. This is the gift that they want. This is the ministry they're going to have. And no matter what, they're going to do it, even though God hasn't anointed them. And there's nothing worse than trying to do something God hasn't called you to do. And, and again, I, I uh, learned that the hard way, very much so. And so one of the things that I tell people is, look, uh, if you're going to be walking with the Lord, once you know who he is, please really know who you are. You know, if you're not sure, ask some friends what they see you doing, what they don't see you doing. And don't try and be someone you're not. Don't try and be someone else. You know, you can't be anybody else. You can only be yourself. And God has us all as a body with different gifts to be ourselves. We get these calls quite a bit on the radio uh, from, and it's all, always a guy. I don't know if it's the same guy, but it's always a guy that calls up and he says, I'm a great Christian. You know, I listen to the radio 24-7, you know, Christian TV, Christian books, and I, I love doing it, but I don't go to church. Is that okay? And we say, no, 
well, why not? I'm getting fed. I'm getting all this stuff. We said, wait, wait. You've got gifts that God has given you, and you are robbing us because you're holding out and you're not sharing with the rest of us as the body of Christ to build each other up. We have gifts to share with one another, and they're all different. We, we don't all have the same gifts. Some people, like Barry, is a wonderful gift of teaching. Uh, you've got people like the musicians here who just do a fabulous job. God has gifted them. Uh, but we've all got something to contribute to help each other out. But again, the last thing you want to do is try and be something you're not, because it's not going to be very ha happy. And um, again, that's not what the Lord would have us to do. So again, as one who's learned the hard way, remember, uh, know your limitations. Know what you can do, what you can't do, and go forward. So not only know who God is, know who you are. Number three, the third thing that I would tell you that's helped me out is know what we believe about God and why we believe it. All right. Once you know who God is, once you know who you are, then discover what you believe about God and why you believe it. And this is what got me in the whole field of defending the faith, apologetics, which is really for, first and foremost what I do. It's just interesting as Dave and I were talking uh, tonight before the service, almost everywhere I go, I speak on Bible prophecy because someone asks me to do it. But when I not ask, I will never speak on the subject, because not that I don't like it, but I've got so many other things, you know, I do. I wrote 25 books on different subjects before I even touched Bible prophecy, simply because there's so much more for us, just like this message tonight on, you know, living successfully in God's eyes. Who is Jesus Christ? Why do, why do we believe in him? And so that's always been my passion, answering people's difficult questions about the Christian faith. But we've got to know not only what we believe, but why we believe. And the verse here would be 1 Peter 3. 315, to always have an answer for the people that ask us a reason that's in us, yet with meekness and fear or gentleness and reverence. In other words, to know what we believe as Christians as well as why we believe it. So if tonight after the service, someone, you know, you run into someone, they ask you, where were you tonight? You know, midweek. Oh, I was at church. Really? You go to church in the middle of the week? I thought you only went on Sunday. That's what my friends said when I became a Christian. No, you only go on Sunday. No, no, I go every night. Um, well, why did you go to church? You know, because I'm a Christian. Well, what do Christians believe? You could probably tell them, or we should be able to, what we believe as Christians. We believe God has spoken to us in the Bible. It's the Word of God. God the Son came 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ, became a human being, lived a perfect life, uh, died on Calvary's cross for our sins, came back from the dead three days later, ascended into heaven, and now is going to judge the living and the dead someday. He's going to come back, and he's divided humanity into two groups, the saved and the lost. Those that believe in him are saved, those that don't are lost, and there's no third choice. And that is the great message we preach. And again, like we always say, the three basic questions in life— Identity, purpose, destiny. Who am I? Why am I here? What is going to happen to me when I die? All right, those are the answers that the Bible gives to us. And so that's what Christians believe. But what if someone would ask you, okay, well, why are you a Christian? You know, why aren't you a, um, you know, an, a Buddhist, a Zoroastrian, you know, uh, you know, whatever it might be? Why, why a Christian? You need to have some answers. I remember when I was first a Christian, I, um, I went to a, I think I might have mentioned this Sunday to one of the services, I went to uh, actually Santa Ana College over here. I was taking some classes um, there to get some credits. The, the Bible college I was going to was rather expensive, so I get rid of some of the units at the junior college. And I took a class in philosophy and I took a class in religion, all right? And so because I, you know, really wanted to know and wanted to learn. And I remember the very first day of the class, I thought I was going to be this good Christian, you know, and, and start going off after the professor. And, uh, he, you know, it's a religion class. He says, we're going to learn about other religions. And I raised my hand and said, I already know what I believe. I believe in Jesus. You know, he's the one. You know, I gave a testimony right there in front of the whole class. And my life has been changed since I've been a Christian. And the professor says, well, I've got my Buddhist Bible here, and I believe in Buddha, and I've been a different person ever since I've been a Buddhist. Uh, how do I respond to that? Uh, hmm, yeah, okay. See, a testimony by itself, we've got to have more than that. And he, he was just saying that. He wasn't really a Buddhist, but he was saying that to teach me. He said, how can I teach you anything? And I said, well, I'm, I'm open to hearing. We had actually ended up with a pretty good relationship over the years, a couple of years, where we, we disagreed, but we talked back and forth. But I realized I needed something else. I needed some facts. I needed some evidence. And lo and behold, fortunately, when I was going back to the Christian school, we had a couple people come in 
that talked about the evidences for the Christian faith. I'd never heard this before. When I became a Christian, it was only because I had a life-changing experience. I knew it was true, like the song, you asked me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. I know he lives. But what do you do with someone who says, well, I know he lives in my heart, I'm a Mormon. I know he lives in my heart, I believe this or that. We've got to have something else, and we do. And that's the evidences for the Christian faith, to give intelligent answers to people that ask us what we believe about Christ and why we believe it. And so that's very important that we do that, that we have these answers, to be ready always, Peter says, to give an answer concerning the hope that's in you. And there are some excellent resources out there that we have in this world to give these answers to people that want to know what we believe and why we believe it. In other words, we're not believing by blind faith. We're not assassinating our brains to be a Christian. We can actually think and be a Christian at the same time. That's the wonderful truth of the Christian faith. We don't have to bury our heads in the sand. We can actually think. So, number three is know what you believe and why you believe. And when you do that, again, this will help you live more successfully in God's eyes because you'll be confident in your faith. Be confident what you believe. Now, the fourth is don't compromise your convictions. Don't compromise your convictions. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, once you know what we believe and why we believe, don't compromise those convictions that you hold. And let me tell you, this is the main thing I worry about today with Christians. And I, I don't want to start going off of some tangent here. I might, but I don't want to do it. Um, about so many people today who are sometimes very high-profile Christians, but because they get in the public eye, they will compromise their convictions to the way where they will not, you know, really, um, really stand for what the truth is in Jesus. And it's, it's, you know, in many cases, it's hard to do. You're there, and, and uh, I remember on this talk show many years ago, there was a, a friend of mine who was actually a Christian who was doing it, and he had the, the host kind of come there and put his arm around him and said, now look, you don't really believe that people are going to go to hell that don't believe in Jesus, do you? There's a lot of good people here. We've got, you know, people who are Jewish in the crowd, people of other religions, people who are Muslim, and, they're, and atheists, Stephen, they're good people. They're not, they're not going to go to heaven, are they? Or go to hell, are they? And the person, you know, sitting there like, that. well, I don't know, maybe, you know, there'll, there'll be another, you know, and basically caving in on what the Bible has to say. And it's, it's so easy to do. And, and one of the signs of the last days, one of my 25 signs, is the apostasy in the church, the falling away from the visible church of the truth of God. Uh, I had a professor once in Bible college, and he, I'll never forget what he said. He said, if you, if you want to be everybody's friend, you, you can't be if you're a Christian, because you're not going to be everybody's friend if you stay true to what the Bible says. And he would give examples where he would go to these places and speak, and they thought he was like the man in the moon, because he would say, there's a right, there's a wrong. There's a one way to get to God, and that's the way of, of Jesus, because that's the claims that he made. And so the issue is that we live in a day and age where uh, this mindset is, well, look, as long as it helps you, if it's good for you, then that's fine. If it's true for you, that's wonderful. But it, what's true for you might not be true for me. And we hear that, I can't tell you how many times on a college campus I heard that when I was evangelizing people. Well, here's though what Jesus said. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the truth. Not just a truth, he is the truth. He is your truth, he is my truth, he is the truth for everyone. He is not, you know, just a truth for Christians. He's a truth for every human being, whether they believe in him or not. He is the truth. And so what we have to understand is we can't compromise that message. It's very easy to do in our world because of the pressure that's there of, you know, just kind of watering it down a little bit to try and get along with everybody. But that's not right. That's not right. We need not to compromise our convictions whatsoever to keep them. Now, again, uh, we don't have to grab people by the throat, you know, and try and bring them into the kingdom of God. We, we be loving, we be caring, but we certainly don't compromise our convictions whatsoever. We can't do that. It is so easy to do. I've seen so many uh, high-profile Christians that uh, got in situations and they've kind of let the situations take over them and they've compromised, you know, in front of the world. Uh, what the Christian faith stands for. And once you do that, you're going to lose all respect. Um, whether people agree with us or not, a lot of times they're not. We've got to stand for the truth, and that's, that's what we're called to do. And it's not popular. A lot of times, you know, it's not popular whatsoever, but it's the right thing to do. 
So uh, not only know what you believe and why you believe it, but once you have those convictions, don't compromise them, okay? Know what they are and don't compromise them. All right, the next principle, and this is a huge, not the others aren't, this is a huge one, don't major on the minors. Don't major on the minors. Um, say, what do you mean? Well, look, life is short, and we need to spend our lives on things that are important. I've met so many Christians, and particularly those that get, I'll, I'll, I'll pick one particular subject, those that, you know, get involved in, in they, all they do is go to these um, prophecy seminars. They go to the next, jump one to another. It's funny, there was groups, uh, I remember uh, when I lived up in Washington State, there was a, 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 a um, weekly meeting of these people that would, all he did was talk, they talked about this over and over again. And it was interesting, one person visited that, he said, you know, the type of people that showed up at this, I've never seen any of them at church, but they, they come to this sort of thing, you know, to find out, you know, not that we shouldn't, because that's part of the gospel, of course, and part of the message, but that's all they talk about. But they had their charts out, you know, they would roll them out, and they can tell you everything that's going to happen in the future. We know exactly who the Antichrist mother-in-law is. We know all this stuff. We got everything down, you know, down pat. And they're so interested in these minute details, they kind of miss the forest for the trees. And so they major on things that are minor. The same professor I mentioned earlier gave a great illustration, I thought. He said, you know, we will be against things in this life. As a Christian, you're gonna be against this, against that, and you might spend your life on causes. He said, but, let me warn you, when people see you, don't let them ever think that you are oh, here comes brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. You are anti this, anti this, or against that. No. Yeah, you're going to be against certain things, but they need to see all of us as someone who's pro-Jesus, someone who's for him. That is what we need to stand up, as someone who's a Jesus man or a Jesus girl, okay? That's the whole idea. We've got to be people who are known for standing up for him. But a lot of people will major on the minors. They'll get into causes, maybe good causes, but they forget the prime directive that we have, and that is to be salt and light and to preach the gospel to the entire world. That's what God's called us to do. And we, you know, so many people spend their lives majoring on things that are not important. There is this uh, little phrase, I'm sure you've heard it, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. We talked about this Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to stand someday before the Christ on the judgment seat, and he's going to ask us something. Well, how you, how'd, you, how'd you do? How'd you do since you became a Christian? What'd you do for me? What'd you do for the kingdom of God? And many people will have little, if anything, to show for it. Yeah, they're a believer, and maybe they haven't done something bad, but they haven't done anything good. They just haven't uh, done much at all. It uh, reminds me of a story. Now, whether this is a true story or not, it should be, okay? So I, I heard it was. I had this same professor told it many, many, many years ago. He said there was this, uh, it illustrated about people in life who just kind of go through life and really don't accomplish anything. They go through, they major on the minors, or they go through life and just kind of make it through and nothing. Anyway, a small town in the Midwest, as the story goes, many, many, many years ago, uh, there was this one woman who was the, you know, the uh, very well-known person, but she was a recluse. She lived at the big house at the end of town. Uh, she was fairly wealthy, but uh, nobody knew much about her. Her name was Nancy Jones, and everybody knew the big house at the end of town, Nancy Jones was there, but no one knew much about her. No one, uh, you know, ever, would hardly ever see her, and so, you know, they would pass the house, but she was well known to everybody. A small town, but they, they knew just very little about her. Anyway, Nancy Jones dies, and so they have the weekly paper. In those days, they had these papers, you know, small towns come out once a week, and the editor says t to one of his reporters, uh, he said, look, you have to do some type of epitaph uh, to put something in the paper and something on the grave cones for, uh, on, the, on, on the tombstone for Nancy Jones because we don't know anything about her. We don't know what to write. And the, the reporter, you know, because it's a small town, he says, look, I'm the sports reporter. I'm, I don't do funeral things. And he says, look, we got to put something there because everybody's expecting something in the paper. We got to put something on her, on her tombstone. And he says, okay, I'll do what I can. You know, they had a week before the, the paper came out, before they're going to have the official burial. Anyway, um, he comes back a couple days later, and he says, you know, to the, the editor-in-chief, says, boss, I don't know what to tell you. 
I can't find anything about this woman. She didn't, you know, ever do anything right, didn't ever do anything wrong, didn't do anything her whole life. Her whole life was a big zero. No one knows anything about her. I can't find anything. She never got arrested, never thrown in jail, never got drunk and disorderly. She didn't do anything. Big zero. And so I don't know what to put. And that guy says, look, I know you're the sports reporter. I know this is not your, your, your gig, but you got to put something in the paper on the epitaph that will go also on her tombstone. Finally, he came up with something. And as the paper came out that week, and as the tombstone was cut, here is what he wrote. Here lies the bones of Nancy Jones, for her life held no terrors. She lived an old maid. She died an old maid. No hits, no runs, no errors. Well, that speaks of a lot of people, huh? When they look at our life, no hits, no runs, no errors. Didn't do anything right, didn't do anything wrong, just didn't do anything. That shouldn't be us. We need to get in the game. I remember one of the first Christian books I read was a man named Bill Glass, who still has this prison ministry, Evangelistic Association, and he talked about if you're a Christian, he was a pro football player for the Cleveland Browns, he said you need to get in the game. You need to participate. You don't want your life just to be a big zero, a big nothing. Get out there and, you know, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fall. And you're going you're to do things that you, you know, that you shouldn't do. You're going to make mistakes, probably make a fool of yourself sometimes, but you're at least trying. And so, again, if you're doing that, you want to try to do things that are important in life, not to major on the minors, but major on those things that are important. Because before you know it, you're going to turn around and life is going to be, you know, you're on the back nine of life and you're looking at it, most of it in the rear view mirror now. And you ask yourself, is this really what I want to be? Is this really what I wanted to accomplish? You know, is this really what I thought I was going to be, you know, X number of years ago? Well, the point is, we don't have to get ourselves in that particular situation. Don't major on the minors. All right, the next one is um, don't, <laughs> it's basically reach out to others. Reach out to others. This, this one here, I think, is, is one that um, if anything is a cure for depression, if anything is a cure for being bummed out or, or, or looking sad at ourselves, it, it's this one here. Um, <sighs> We all have issues, we all have problems. We all have things that aren't going right in our lives. Let's face it, we do, that's the nature of us. But you know something? There's always people, many people, who would give anything to trade places with you. Yeah, they'll take your problems any day. And one of the things that we need to do is learn to reach out for, to those who basically are, um, are in need, basically who, who need something that we can give them because we have been blessed in a way that they haven't. Many times we just, you know, our prayers are, you know, God bless you, me, us four, no more. That's it. You know, we, 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 we look in a little, little small area when God wants us to expand and reach out. Paul in Philippians 2 says, just don't do things for yourself. Don't look, not only for yourself, we're to look on our own needs, that's true, but also on the needs of others. If you want to explain the ministry of Jesus in one way, it would be the word others. There's a story, again, I heard uh, when I was in uh, Bible college from a man that came and preached to us. And I think I've told you this before in the past. If you've heard this, it was probably years ago, and I'm going to tell it again because it, it's so worthwhile. He, this, he came to speak to our uh, chapel service. I was going to a Christian school. This is in like 1972, something like that. And he was a very well-known pastor. He had one of the largest churches in the United States, huge church, something like 20,000 people would come through on, on a Sunday morning, huge, and uh, very much in demand. But this person, uh, shall we say quirky or eccentric, if you look up the word eccentric or quirky in the dictionary, this guy's picture would be there. I mean, he was different. He would, God used him. I mean, bless his heart. Anyway, he told a story that, that fits along this line about reaching out to others. He says, you know, I've, I'm a pastor of a large church, and because I am, I don't get to know my congregation. You know, I can't. I have too many people to come. I would love to, but I just can't get to know them all. And he said, I have a group of a staff. And he said something like the counseling pastors, there were something like a dozen of them at least that he had, and probably more. But he said, nobody, nobody gets the first shot, you know, at counseling to come to me. He said, I am the last resort. I get the ones that no, no, one, no one else can help because, you know, basically I, I just can't take the, the huge problems there. And he said, I've got great people. But every once in a while, I'll get someone come to me 
and I will be literally their last resort. And so I do what I can. You know, sometimes I can do things, sometimes I can't, and, but I'll do what I can. And then he told this story about this woman that came in to see him, <clears throat> and she finally, you know, got the appointment, and she said, I'm so thankful, Pastor, we have this appointment together because you are my last resort. I went through the assistant pastor, the assistant to the assistant, goes down all the lists, some, something like eight or nine different counselors. Nobody could help her, no one whatsoever. <clears throat> and she said, you are my last hope. I am going to have a nervous breakdown, and I planned it for Tuesday. Unless you help me right now, I'm going to just fall apart. He said, okay, lady, tell me your problem. <clears throat> and he said she talked for 45 minutes. He didn't do anything, he just sat there and listened. 45 minutes, and just and listen, and finally, whew, can you help me, pastor? And he says, yeah, I think I can. She goes, I knew it. If anybody could help me, it's the pastor of the church. He's the one. He says, she says, oh, what do I do? I said, okay, take out a pencil and a piece of paper, and I want you to write this down, what I tell you to do. She's really excited now, okay. He said, first of all, I want you to go home, and I want you to bake a cake. She said, excuse me, something must be wrong with my hearing. What? No, I want you to go home and bake a cake. Go home, bake a cake. Okay. Now what, pastor? And then he said, okay, after you bake this cake, I want you to make a huge batch of cookies. And she's sitting there. He said, no, write it down, write it down. Now, at this time, she was starting to look around the room saying, you know, I usually sit in the back. I think this guy's the pastor. I don't really get a good look at him. You know, yes, his name on the you know, diploma on the wall, but he's telling me after 45 minutes of pouring my heart out to go home and bake a cake and bake some cookies. And so she said, uh, what do you want me to do with this pastor? He said, here's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to take the cake and I want you to cut it in about a dozen pieces, as many as you can, and I want you to go down to the retirement home and give it out to the people that are there. He said, then once you put the cookies together and make them, I want you to go to the children's wing of the hospital and hand them out there. After you're done, I want you to come back and tell me about your problem. Well, she thought he was nuts. She left. He didn't see her. Comes back, you know, week two, three weeks, four weeks, never came back. He said, finally, about six or seven weeks later, he sees her leaving one of the services of the church. And yet, the, but he's not going to be able to reach her because the building is so big. She's on the other side of the church. So there's nothing he can do. He can't catch her. So the only, again, this guy's quirky. The only thing he can do, he said, I cut my hands over my mouth and I shouted out at the top of my voice, hey lady, how's your nervous breakdown coming? You know, can you imagine the pastor saying that? All the way across the church. He said, she turned around, looked at me with the biggest smile you'd ever seen. It looked like she'd swallowed a coat hanger. Her smile was so big. And she cupped her hands and yelled back, Pastor, I'm so busy reaching out to others, I don't have time for a nervous breakdown. See, she learned a very valuable lesson. No matter how tough we think we have it, when we start reaching out to others, it won't seem so tough after all. And so that's the key, the word others, the word that's explains Jesus, why he came to earth. Matthew 20, 28, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to do what? Give his life a ransom for many. And so if we want to live successfully in God's sight, one of the things we have to do is think about others. Because when we do that, God will bless us. And uh, so many examples, I'm sure we all can share testimonies on this. I can tell you example after example when uh, I th thought, you know, Lord, I'm gonna, just going to do this for you and, uh, you know, don't expect anything back. And the Lord sometimes blesses above and beyond anything I can ask or think. Now, that's not why I do something. He just does it because that's who he is. He don't do it for that reason. But God wants to bless us. But we have to reach out. We have to get out of our comfort zone and help people, help people with the gifts that we have, sometimes that are a lot less fortunate than us. And like I said, there were people, any, many people, I've traveled to so many parts of the world where they would trade places with any of us today because of the situation, no matter how bad it is, it's nothing compared to what they go through. And so to live successfully that way, reach out to others. All right, basically, and there's a few more, but I'm, I'm out of time, I gotta wrap it up now. Um, when you have these issues, when you're thinking life is, is kind of got you down, when you think it's, it's uh, it's too much, it's overwhelming. Hopefully you can remember some of the things I've said to you this evening, all biblical principles. First and foremost, 
Understand who God is. Really know God. Get to know him. Uh, get to know, you know, study and never, you know, wear out the pages of that Bible. Uh, find out what he says about himself, uh, how he works, how he operates. And when you understand that, when you start to get it, then you realize, hey, he's on our side and he can do it. He's able and willing to do something about the problems I face. That number one. And then once you do that, okay, then find out what gifts you have. Don't try to be something you're not, but see how you fit in in God's plan and purpose for time and eternity. In other words, see what God has for your life and have a realistic view of yourself. Don't try and be something you're not, but be who God's made you. And then as you're doing this, understand what you believe about our God and why you believe it so you can tell others because people need to hear the gospel message. So know what you believe as well as why you believe. The Lord wants us to know that. He commands us to know that. Then once we understand what we believe and why we believe, let us never compromise those convictions. Let us keep them, even though it's difficult. You know, we explain what the Christian faith's all about. Now, again, people, if they don't like it, they're not hating us, they're hating Jesus. But if you're going to be a, you know, a, a, a consistent Christian, you're going to tell the message, as Jesus said. You're not going to water it down. You're not going to say there's many ways. There's one way to get to the one God. This is not our message. This is his message. He did, we didn't make it up. He did. You know, if you have a problem, take it up with Jesus. But he's the one that said it. We're just telling you what he said. And so don't compromise those. And then what you want to do is not to major on the minors. Once you know who God is, who you are, what and why you believe, and, and, you know, and not to compromise this message, spend your life living it, promoting it, not just wasting your life on some little area over here or being like Nancy Jones, whose life doesn't mean anything, who just kind of went through life and never did anything right, never did anything wrong, just never did anything. Uh, get involved, you know, get involved. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to fail, we all do. I remember there was a wonderful little tract I read and I was in Colorado, 1976, 77, a discipleship book, and it's a little line I've never forgotten. It said this, if you're gonna disciple someone, give them the freedom to fail. Give them the freedom to fail. In other words, they're gonna make mistakes. They may not want to, but they're gonna make them. Give them that freedom, because we need the freedom to fail as we keep going forward. Like someone said, if you're gonna fall, at least fall forward, right? Keep moving forward. So again, not to major on the minors, take care of these important things. And then also to, to reach out to others, to reach out to others, the less fortunate, those that are uh, you know, a lot worse off than us, those that can use our love, those that can use our help, those that can use the Christianity that we have. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. And if you do these things, if you start putting these principles together in your life, you know, and each one maybe uh, has a different one you, you feel God's speaking to you about, let me tell you something. Life can be a lot different. Life can be really rewarding. Life can be uh, life-changing, as it will, because you're watching the supernatural work. It's not something natural. It's not something normal. It's beyond the natural, the supernatural, God working in your life. It's very, very practical. And here's the wonderful thing. It really does work. It does when you allow God to be God. So tonight, as you leave here and think about what we've said, just ask the Lord, Lord, what are these things, you know, in my life do I need to work on? Do I need to work on knowing you better? Do I need to work on knowing myself better, reaching out to others? Whatever it might be, allow the Lord to work in you. And if you do, I guarantee you, life's going to look a whole lot better, and you're going to have many victories that you never had before because you're allowing the Lord to be God in your life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are a God of all flesh, a God who can do anything, a God who is on our side. I pray for each of us in here that you will help us understand who you are as the God of all eternity, as the God who spoke and the universe came into existence. And so tonight, Lord, as we're looking at the problems we have, let us look at them in light of who you are, in light of your majesty, in light of your greatness. And Lord, also let us understand who we are. Let us look at ourselves the way you see us as, as your, you know, your, your children, as the king's kids working for the kingdom of God. Help us be that person you would have us to be. Everything you have us to be, nothing more, nothing less. And Lord, also we ask you to help us to know what we believe as Christians and why we believe it so we can intelligently tell people what the Christian faith is all about. We can explain it in such a way where they can understand it. And then, Lord, once we know this, please help us not to compromise at work, at school, at home. It's so easy to do. Help us to take a right stand for you and your word. 
And then, of course, not major on the areas that are small, but spend our life majoring on the things that are important. So when we stand before you, we will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And Lord, above all, as we know all these things, help us to put it in practice by reaching out to others, by caring for those who really maybe can't help themselves or can't help themselves very much, but we can be a big difference in their life. Give us the grace to do this. Lord, thank you that you have empowered us through your Holy Spirit to do these things. Give us the grace now to follow these principles that you give in your word so we can be that person you would have us to be. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. All right. Come on. I found the answers you need on your listening. I'll tell you the truth about God. My eyes haven't seen him. These hands never touched him. I've never seen the wind, but I've been